Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we get started, I want to ask you a question. Every single week, we bring you these episodes full of dozens of skills, habits, routines, and strategies to help you become more superhuman. Now, be honest. What percentage of those things are you actually able to implement in your life? Of course not. You need the accountability and community. And that's why in 2018, I launched the Becoming Superhuman Mastermind. Every month as a community, we invite a world-renowned expert in to lead a one-month challenge. Past challenges have included environmental design with Benjamin Hardy, hacking your sleep with Nick Littlehales, who is Cristiano Ronaldo's own sleep coach, and meditation with Muse founder Ariel Garten. On top of that, we send out a care package with all the gear and goodies you need to complete that month's challenge. And best of all, as a member, you get exclusive discounts to all kinds of events, courses, supplements, and gear. And those discounts alone are worth more than your entire membership. Look, as a listener, of this podcast, we know that you stand to benefit a great deal from being in the group, but also that you stand to contribute a lot. And that's why we're offering 50% off your first month. To join, visit superhuman.blog slash mastermind today. Greetings, super friends, and welcome, welcome to a very special episode of the show. You guys, today we are joined by a four-time New York Times best-selling author. She's a prominent TV and media personality who has been featured as a co-host of TLC's Freaky Eaters and has spent years as the on-camera nutritionist for weight loss challenges everywhere from Dr. Phil to Dr. Oz to PBS, Rachel Ray, Access Hollywood, and even the Today Show. She's also a successful serial entrepreneur with a number of events, summits, organizations, and an entire line of food and nutrition products with her name on it. I'm talking, of course, about JJ Virgin. Now, if you haven't heard of JJ, you've probably been living under a rock So don't worry, we are going to get you caught up to speed on this woman who is a force of nature in the health and wellness industry. We're going to learn how she got to where she is and all the health recommendations that have made her one of the top top thought leaders in the space. It's an incredible conversation packed with all kinds of learnings. I learned a ton. And as you'll see, I definitely hit it off with JJ and look forward to hearing what you all have to say. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with JJ Virgin. JJ Virgin, welcome to the show. How are you, my friend? I'm awesome. And you? I'm doing really, really well. I'm so excited to finally meet. I seem to keep missing you at events and Genius Network meetings and all kinds of stuff. So I'm really glad we're going to get to know one another. Yeah, even though it's uh, ways far away. Let's see, you're across the world. Maybe one of these days we'll run into each other in person. I'm quite confident. So JJ, I'm pretty sure everyone in our audience knows all about you and your work, but for the three people out there who don't, and also because I personally, as someone who does a lot of different stuff, I always wonder, someone like yourself who does a lot of stuff, how do you explain what you do? Do you identify as an author, an entrepreneur, all of the above? Gosh, (laughs) that is a good one. You know, it's always like when you're writing down on your passport or something, like, what do you do? And you're like, what do I write down there? Do I just write consultant? And I'd say, you know, when you're sitting next to someone on a plane, the last thing I ever want to do is tell them what I do. Like, I never would tell them there I'm a weight loss coach because you're going to end up done for the, the whole flight. You know, it really depends on the audience because I have three very distinct businesses Mm-hmm. And one is for the consumer, obviously, and that's the books and the TV shows and the products and the programs. And that is where I really focus on. I think I was the original biohacker, Jonathan, because mm-hmm. 
you know, 25 years ago, I was like going, all right, let's pull foods out and put other foods in and see what works and what doesn't work. So if that's not biohacking, I don't know what is. So there's the first one, all the different things you can do to help you lose weight and feel better fast and de-age. And then from that, I actually before that, I really was doing practice development for docs. So I have a company that helps doctors, health experts, health influencers, create a bigger impact out in the world. And then we have a, a new one coming up. It was that I didn't mean to start this business, which is the same thing with Mindshare. It was I didn't mean to start this business, but I needed it for myself. And mm-hmm. so I now have a seven, eight, nine figure women's mastermind club that I didn't mean to start. I started with a friend, but we wanted a place to go. So there you go. <laughs> now we have that too. Yeah. I love that. And there's definitely not nearly enough support groups for women in entrepreneurship. I mean, I was in EO. A lot of guys. A lot of guys yeah. in EO. <laughs> well, it's the stats. And you know, here's the thing. I think we should be all together. In my mindshare community, it's actually 70% women because the statistics in functional medicine are 70% women. But it's I find having the blend and the balance is better. But there's just certain things that we do differently as women. So it was kind of fun. It's fun to go to things like, you know, Genius Network and Mastermind Talks and Archangel where there's a good mix and or genius. Hey, there's not a big mix. It's a lot of dudes, <laughs> a couple of women, let's face it. But then it's, it's great to have our time just to talk about what's a little different when women approach business. Cause we have some different things we do. Absolutely. Now I want to ask you a tough personal question, but I generally find, and I don't know if you found this with entrepreneurs who have had the kind of impact that you've had, and this has been in my life as well, that the desire to help people comes from a personal struggle. Is that true in your case? You know, it's interesting. So it's actually, so I'm adopted. And what I've discovered that there's two things that I do without even thinking about it. You know, Dan Sullivan would call it your unique ability. One of them is putting on events. I love having parties and putting on events more than anything, but that actually goes back to the first one. And the first one is building community. And I think growing up, I never felt like I really fit in with my family. They're fantastic people, but being adopted, I was so different from them. And what's kind of funny is when I found my birth parents, I have a father who's a self-made massive entrepreneur and a mother who is a scientist. You know, so it's like, oh, it works, is there it? you go. Yep, there you go. It is insane how everything just came together. But I think all of these things, the core of all my businesses is community and creating connections. And so I think it was just that deep seated wound. Um, Phil McKiernan says, you know, gosh, I'm going to totally destroy this quote, but it was something about, you know, right next to your greatest wound lies your greatest gift. Yeah. Totally. No, I feel the exact same way. And then what drew you to specifically diet and nutrition? I was always very athletic and in the wrong sports for me. I was doing dance, ballet dancing, actually tap dancing too, and gymnastics, which I'm six feet tall. These are not the right sports for (laughs) six feet tall. It's like, where was the basketball and volleyball, which I was doing too, but more of point ballet and and gymnastics. So, you know, nutrition just fits straight in with that. And I grew up in Berkeley, which was a very health conscious focused community. Very cool. Go Bears, by the way. Go Bears. Well, I was a Bruin, so go Bruins. Ah, fair enough. Yep, there you go. But, you know, growing up that way, I was very, very interested in nutrition and health and what could help me be a better athlete. So that was where that all came from. I mean, age 12, that was just what I became obsessed with. Amazing. And at some point you realized that the traditional diet, shocker, the traditional American diet, was not (laughs) powering your body or you were doing a lot of coaching as well. And you realized that this was not helping the people that you were coaching. Tell me about that epiphany. You know, I feel so vindicated because a, a Time Magazine special had just came out and I bought it and it was the science of weight loss. And literally it's all these things for the last 30 years I've been saying that people looked at me like I was, you know, at horns. Right. And, you know, here's where it came from. I was, it was me, Body by Jake and Mark Sisson, first couple of personal trainers that I know of anywhere in the world. You know, before then it, they were coaches, right? And... 
I knew pretty quickly that no one was going to pay me to get worse. But what I was being taught in graduate school, which was eat less, exercise more, cut your fat really, really low, do loads and loads of aerobics, was making, especially the clientele I had, which were men and women that were 35 plus, a lot of the men were 45 plus, it was trashing them. Mm -hmm. And I would go to Gold's Gym in Venice. In Gold's Gym in Venice, the mecca of bodybuilding, People looked amazing, and they weren't doing any of the things we were learning to do in school. They weren't doing cardio. They were doing, if anything, they only did high-intensity interval training. They did loads of weights, heavy. They didn't eat a, a vegan or vegetarian diet. They ate fat, and I'm like, all right, huh. I'm looking at how great they look. I'm looking at how crappy the people following the recommendations look and the professors teaching it. And I thought, you know, head scratcher, I'm not going to get paid and be successful if I teach people how to get worse. So I went back into the libraries and, and you know, I actually had to go to the library. There was no Google back then. So I, there I was in the <laughs> stacks at UCLA in the biomed library. And lo and behold, we didn't used to recommend this. We used to recommend low carb. We used to recommend, like, if you look at the Eastern European trainers, and you look at any athlete, and, unless they're a marathon runner, any sports out there, this whole thing is around high intensity interval training, not long, slow distance cardio. So I switched it up and I started doing things differently. And I started talking about how our body is into chemistry or a bank account. It's a chemistry lab that we have to look at how things. And back then there was no exercise endocrinology, but I knew that something had to be going on that when we lifted weights, all of a sudden it was like it was changing our interest rate of our body. We burnt more calories. We burnt more fat. We were leaner. We didn't lose it if we went away for a week. You know, if you stop doing cardio exercise within a month, you've lost all those shifts in resistance training, it's not the case. So that's where I really started to make the changes. I realized that while calories count, it's really where they come from counts more. Now we know it's not just where they come from. It's also when they come in that counts, mm -hmm. right? I think that's some of the most interesting new research is, is not just hacking what you're eating, but hacking when you're eating it. And, uh, you know, it's just the, the proof is in the pudding. You can do any research out there and prove just about anything. But, you know, I was seeing hundreds of clients and then thousands through online and, you know, able to prove my hypothesis. Yeah. I mean, the medicine works, unlike the medicine that we've been fed for 40 years. Well, clearly, if it worked, we wouldn't have a now. I mean, it is. So turn of the century, 0.5% obesity. Now in the U.S., 40% obesity. And, and people are like, it's our genes. I'm like, well, no, 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 because it's been 100 years. Your genes are the same genes. They're the same genes. I think they say it's 3% that you can blame on genes with obesity, which is really encouraging, actually, because that means we've got control. So obviously, what's the difference? Well, it's toxins. It's what we're eating. You know, it's this crappy toxic food, but also a lot of the toxins out in the environment and then technology that are just doing us in. You know, we're not moving. We've got a lot of EMFs. We've got a lot of toxins in the food, water, air, everything else. And then we've got just terrible food and a stressed out lifestyle and poor sleep. <laughs> yeah, it's everything. It's, you know, I think you also have been podcasting for a long time about health and it's kind of the same three or four things. It's like, are you sleeping well? Are you exercising? Are you eating real food? And then one that I'll add that I want to give credit to Rob Wolf for, which he added into his book. It's also, do you have the social connections that are causing you to be emotionally healthy enough to do the other three, sleep well, eat well, and exercise? Yeah, so big. That's why, honestly, like everything I do is about building communities and building real communities where people people actually meet each other face to face. I know that's kind of shocking nowadays, but right. you know, you can't release oxytocin over the airways. Mm -hmm. Totally true. And I've been so inspired by all the events that you and Dave and Joe Polish are doing. And I'm like, man, we need to get our community face to face and actually get people learning from one another in person. And uh, here's the thing I see with all that. I've really flipped the way I do events now because I realize we can learn anything online now. And it is fantastic. But what we can't do online is create those deep connections that only happen in person. We can't play, you know. So my events always have these elements, things that foster deep connections, things that foster a lot of play so that people really get to know each other. 
And then they can share ideas and feel that connection, everything else. Sure, we put some learning in there too, but that's the least important piece of it. I think the most important piece of it is creating those deep connections and great relationships. Absolutely. You know, it's it's like that Maya Angelou quote, people will very quickly forget what you taught them, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Right. I love that. So give me the high level. I, I don't want to ask you to summarize the entire virgin diet, but give me the high level. So I understand, I mean, it's from the sound of it, very similar to a paleo or a caveman type thing. How do you identify the differences? It actually isn't. It's not. You know, it's funny. When I wrote that diet, I decided to be totally diet agnostic. Now, personally, I loved when uh, my buddy Mark Hyman termed it pegan. I was like, did you trademark that? Oh, my gosh. But (laughs) I love the idea of, you know, should we be eating? I think we should be eating clean animal protein. And that's the big distinguisher. I get so frustrated by the studies that show problems with animal protein when they're looking at factory animals. Mm Mm-hmm. That's a totally different food. You cannot compare farmed salmon and wild salmon, you know, factory cows with grass-fed and finished cows. You can't compare them. They're different foods. So it's just ridiculous. But I chose to be diagnostic on this because both the diet books that I wrote are actually – I wouldn't have called them diets. I wish I could have called them journeys. I have a very different philosophy on diets. I think diets should be something that you do short term for a therapeutic outcome to learn something about yourself, to make a change. And then when you do that, you look at what did I learn from this? What do I need to carry into my everyday life? You bring it into your everyday life. You stabilize your eating plan and then you go, what do I need to work on next? And you work on I'm a Gary Keller obsessed person, but you work on one thing at a time because what do we do wrong? We go, oh my gosh, I'm overweight. I feel like crap. So I'm going to start sleeping better. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to start meditating. I better drink more water. I'm going to increase my fiber. I'll take some supplements. You see the ridiculousness of it, right? Instead of just going, all right, let's work on one thing. I think I have too much sugar in my diet. I'll focus on that. Or I need to start moving. I'll start working on exercise. So with the virgin diet, it purely was built and it can work for a vegan, can work for a vegan, it can work for paleo, it can work even for keto. It's really put together to help you uncover your hidden food intolerances. What I did, and my doctor friends were like, this is ridiculous. Like all you did was take an elimination diet and make it simple and sexy. And I'm like, exactly. That's all I did. That's why it works. (laughs) Uh Because I looked at this. What happened was I was going into doctor's offices. I was working with a company called Metametrics and another company called Designs for Health. And they put together lab testing that would spit out product recommendations. So I was teaching doctors how to use that in their practice. One of the tests was a food sensitivity test. And so I got the chance to look at hundreds of food sensitivity tests. And you know what? Success leaves clues. The same foods would always show up. And it was always the top ones were always dairy and eggs. Always. Mm -hmm. The next ones were soy, corn, and peanuts. Now, a different test is gluten. So you couldn't, you'd see wheat in this test, but you wouldn't see gluten. But I was testing that separately. And obviously, even though sugar isn't something that you would create a um, this type of a food intolerance to, an IgG food intolerance to, it creates leaky gut because fructose like gluten makes the gut more permeable. And if you – I learned early on because I just had six foods at first, gluten, dairy, eggs, corn, soy, and peanuts. And I was having people pull those foods out and they were adding sugar in. So I was like, okay, we'll put sugar as one of the wrong ones too. Right. But the whole reason I did this was that I saw that those were the most likely offenders, you know, 80-20 rule. And if we taught people – I used to have them – come into the office, do the test, wait three weeks, see the results, pull the foods out. Then I thought, well, this is silly. They need something to do while we're waiting for the test results, which took three weeks. So I had them pull the foods out after they took the test. Mm -hmm. And then when they came back, we started challenging them back. And then I realized, you know, they actually don't need to do the test at all because they're getting actually better results by being their own health detective by really connecting the dots, which is so important to do is to say, how do I feel when I eat this food? Does it make me feel better or worse? Do I have energy or is it making me inflamed and tired? 
And so that is the whole premise is we're our own personal health detective. You are going to go through, you're going to look at all of your symptoms. You're going to measure yourself because what you measure and monitor, you can improve. And then you're going to pull these foods out. You're going to swap them for other foods. It was really hard six years ago to swap because there wasn't a lot of options. Now there are, but we make simple swaps that most people like better. And then they and add in some gut healing foods and things that help heal your gut, like getting rid of stress or at least learning how to manage it. And then at the end of those three to four weeks, you go back and you test one by one. And what I find is Most people at the end of three to four weeks go, I don't ever want to eat gluten again. I had no idea what it made me feel like, or I don't ever want to touch dairy again, you know, but now it's a smart decision and it's so empowering because when you just pull a food out because someone told you so, and you don't have any proof that makes you feel like crap, you're like, oh, I'll just have a cheat day today. But when you know, when I eat this, my joints are swollen, I feel crappy for three days, you're like, you know, I mean, if, why would you do that? Now you know better and you've got better substitutes, so you don't do it. I love that. And what I love about the whole thing is you emphasize easy as and also path of least resistance. Like if you know what the actual cost of eating that muffin is going to be, it's just easier not to eat the muffin. It's, it's more enjoyable to skip the muffin. Right. Especially if you have some other suggestions that you start to eat that you go, because we're creatures of habit. So if you got up every morning and you went to the coffee place and you got the skim latte, you know, the skim sugar-free latte with the healthy morning muffin, and you just, by the way, doused yourself with sugar and gluten Mm -hmm. and dairy, right? And all of a sudden you went, oh, you know what I could have instead? I could have a an Americano with a little steamed coconut milk. And instead of that, I will just have a little smoothie instead with some bone broth protein. If you did that instead, you go, I feel so much better. <laughs> like this was right. no big deal. You know, all of a sudden you've replaced it. If you don't replace it, and I learned this, I was on this show with TLC called Freaky Eaters, and people would have the weirdest habits. Like they were totally stuck on one type of food, and they had been for like 20, 30 years. And what we found is if we did not replace that with something, then they would just get worse. So you just have to find replacements. You can't just say, hey, no more of that. Have fun. See ya. Bye. Right? <laughs> It's so true. And, you know, as I get older, I've realized just how powerful habit is. I mean, I read Power of Habit years and years ago and was like, oh, okay, cool. But realizing, like, if you want to ingrain something, just latching onto your existing habits. So I got into the habit, like most people do, of drinking coffee in the morning because I like having that bitter with my omelet. And and I realized I don't want caffeine every morning. Easiest thing in the world is three days a week, I switch to decaf maintains the habit, maintains the ritual, maintains the everything, but then I can cycle off of caffeine. And and think of how many times, you know, I really, really, really like my shrimp with pasta. So just switching that to zucchini noodles, keeping the habit and keeping the ritual and keeping like you have this sense of normalcy makes such a difference. Yeah. I mean, then you kind of go, wait, this is actually better. That's the funniest part is you go, ah, I like this better. And within a little while, you that's generally what happens. The first time you might go, oh, I don't like this as well. But by time three or four, you're like, this is better. It's fine. And you forgot all about it. Oh, yeah. And, and I know you're not a big fan of uh, dairy. But when I was on keto, keto pizza is just better than normal pizza because it's like almond flour and all cheese. And it's, you know, like what's not. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, I remember I was in um, Chicago and we went and got a low carb pizza. They made this low carb pizza with sausage as the crust. I kid you not. I was like, Oh my gosh, this is like, it was, this must've been, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how anyone could eat more than a tiny little sliver of this pizza, (laughs) like sausage crust. What's not to love, right? I know, but what's not to love? Sausage crust pizza? Oh my gosh. Like (laughs) throw some bacon on top and we would have had, like it would have been Nirvana. Right. All right. At this point, I want to pause and take a moment to thank our sponsor, Four Sigmatic, who is making it easy for everyday people to unlock the incredible health benefits of mushrooms. I originally learned about Four Sigmatic when I met their founder at a conference in 2015, and I have been pretty much obsessed with their products ever since. Personally, I use their reishi mushroom tea most nights for an all-natural sleep aid. I carry their chaga immunity blend anytime I travel, 
And I've also pretty much switched out my usual coffee or yerba mate for their unbelievably awesome mushroom coffee, either in ground or in instant form. Now, what I love about the mushroom coffee is that it combines chaga for immune support with lion's mane for intense focus. And because of that, I actually find it to be more effective than most nootropics or stimulants, including Ritalin, despite having only 40 milligrams of caffeine. It's honestly insane. If you haven't tried out their products, I strongly, strongly recommend you do so. And to encourage you to give them a try, we've actually teamed up with Four Sigmatic to bring you an incredible 15% discount. To take advantage of that, just visit foursigmatic.com slash superhuman today. All right, back to the show. Now, I want to ask you, because I've been toying with this a lot lately, what's your take on, and you know, some people who are on an all-natural diet will happily eat honey or agave nectar. Some people will eat stevia. What's your take on that? Are you anti-sweet because of the insulin response? Or how do you feel about so-called, quote-unquote, natural sweeteners? So what's the difference to your body if you eat, first of all, agave is horrific. It's the highest concentration of fructose unless you just did crystalline fructose. And your body, fructose makes fat. It goes straight to the liver. It does cause some intestinal permeability on the way. But the problem is it doesn't raise blood sugar, which sounds awesome until you realize if you don't raise blood sugar, you don't raise insulin. So your body thinks, I didn't have anything. So it doesn't trigger any satiety. Nope. It beelines down to the liver. And by the way, the more fructose you eat, the better your body gets at doing this. So this is problematic too. So there it is in the liver, and it's ideally going to be transformed into glucose and stored as glycogen, but there's not a lot of space in the liver, which is why we now have an epidemic of fatty liver is all this fructose. And the idea of going to a health food store and something saying it's healthy because it has agave is absolutely criminal. It is garbage. It's the worst. The very worst of all are artificial sweeteners. Next up is agave. But realize like what is the difference to your body between say honey and table sugar once it gets into your mouth? The answer is nothing. Nothing at all. Now, in honey, if you're getting local, organic, raw, unfiltered honey and you want to use maybe a half a teaspoon for the homeopathic effect for allergies, hey, okay. But if you're trying to kid yourself saying it's all natural, it's not sugar. I literally was at an event last week and Playa del Carmen, Mexico. And someone says, oh, I just don't believe it's sugar. I'm like, it's not a belief thing. It's a biochemistry thing. Just look at the label and read the grams of sugar. It doesn't matter what you believe. Like you can believe it's good or bad, but you can't believe it's not sugar because of course it's sugar. Well, look at what it is. It's sugar. That's what it is. And so when it gets into your mouth, now it's going to break into glucose and fructose, right? So glucose will go raise blood sugar and trigger insulin and fructose will go create some intestinal permeability and then go to the liver. That's it. So, you know, you might have the raw sugar, you might have brown sugar, which is just colored sugar and you have white sugar, but when they get into your mouth, they're all going to start doing the same things. Now, there might be some that are lower in fructose, like coconut sugar, but the bottom line is you want to get these things out of your diet. There's never a reason to add sugar. Just don't add sugar. Now, I will use allulose, which is the non-sugar sugar. I'll use stevia. I'll use xylitol or erythritol. I'll use monk fruit. And my favorites in there would be monk fruit, stevia, allulose. But you still need to be careful. While these are not going to have the blood sugar and insulin response, they still will perk up your taste buds. And when you eat sweet, you crave sweet. So that's what we're trying to get away. Like, you know, why do we have sugar cravings? Well, number one, sugar is the number one recreational drug of choice. I stole that from Dr. Mark Hyman. I love that phrase. So (laughs) that's it. It's a drug. We know it. I mean, they gave rats morphine, lit up the pleasure center of their brain. They gave them Oreo cookies, did the same. They gave them the choice between the two, and they chose the Oreo cookies. It (laughs) is a drug. I mean, it is a drug, right? So we know that. So there's one side of it. We've got the drug part. We've got the genetics of some people. And when I was on the Freaky Eater show, I definitely saw this. There are people who have, because we tested their genes, by the way, that have more of a sweet taste or a sweet tooth. The more sweet they eat, the more sweet they want. 
and they crave sugar. And then we get it from stress. If you are under a load of stress, lowering your serotonin, you're going to crave more sugar. Or we get it because we're insulin resistant. And now our body can't get the sugar into the cells. And once it gets the sugar into the cells, it can't get it out. So all of a sudden you're eating and you're still hungry. And so you're craving sugar. So there's a variety of different reasons that we do this. We can turn it around fairly quickly, but by continuing to eat any kind of sweet, you just keep yourself going, ooh, I'll have more of that. Like you never eat a little bit of sweet and go, okay, I don't want any more of that. That's not how our body is designed. We're hardwired to seek it out so we can survive the famine and, you know, stuff ourselves with fruit all summer during the long days when we sleep less, we're more insulin resistant so we can store a bunch of fat so we can live through the winter. Right. And the, the real kicker, I loved what you said about how we crave more sweet. We recently did an elimination challenge with uh, our private mastermind. We brought someone in who's an expert with helping people get off of alcohol and they're branching out. And the irony is a lot of people came and said, you know, my elimination this month is going to be all sugars. And he goes, well, here's the problem is when you eliminate something, the more willpower you exercise, the more you'll crave sweet. So it's this double whammy. Once you've become addicted to sugar, if you try and get off of it, <laughs> you're going to crave sugar more than you would if it was alcohol or whatever it is. Well, that was the sugar impact diet. After I wrote Virgin Diet, and I never thought this was going to happen because I honestly genetically don't have a sweet tooth. I don't really like sugar. I've gotten myself off of it. And once you get off of it, you're like, ugh, right? So right. I get all of these questions after the virgin diet. Well, can't I have artificial sweeteners? They've got no calories. I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, <laughs> it's like, okay, so we'll slam those. Can't I have honey? It's all natural. So then I thought, all right, I need to write a book on this. And the big thing that we do wrong when we're trying to get off sugar is quit it, is just go cold turkey. When you're already set up as a sugar burner, you are used to using sugar as a primary fuel source. You're eating every couple of hours. You can't lose weight off your waist. And then you're going to just try to pull it out. Your blood sugar is going to crash. You've still got the cravings. So you've got to do a whole tapering and transitioning move while you're retraining your taste buds to have success with this. The worst thing you can ever do is just go, I'm going cold turkey. If you're going to do that, you really should go over to a place like Betty Ford. And Betty Ford, because I used to live in the desert, Betty Ford, the big alcohol center there has got sugar everywhere because as they pull you off the alcohol, what do they give you in place of it? Right. It's ridiculous. <laughs> God help you if they give you any supplements. No, no, no. We'll just give you sugar and coffee. Incredible. So what does that look like? I mean, what I'm trying to get at is should I stop drinking my stevia and my coffee? Because that's really my only guilty pleasure. <laughs> it depends. I don't think a little sweet is a problem if it's not triggering you to want more sweet. Mm. You know, if it's triggering you to want more sweet, if you had a bad diet, that's one thing. But if you're having a little bit of stevia or monk fruit or allulose in your coffee and it's not triggering anything, then you're fine. Right. Right. And what's your stance on fruit? I assume fruit is okay? It depends. You know, the biggest thing I'll tell you about all food and diets is it depends. Anyone who tells you that there's one diet for everybody is not looking at the research. I was going to do a podcast rant on why you should be eating breakfast. And I, I was like, but it depends. Some people should, some people shouldn't. So, you know, it's like you can't ever say there's an absolute. And on fruit, if you're insulin resistant, if you've got hypertension, if you're diabetic, I would say no fruit until you fix your metabolism. And I pull fructose out altogether. And the sugar impact diet, when you're in your transition place, I have fructose out of the diet because I don't want you to be good at moving fructose quickly to the liver and turning it into fat. And I've got to get the fat out of the liver. I've got to get it decongested. Now, if you are insulin sensitive, if you don't have an issue with belly fat, if your blood pressure is normal, if you've got good blood sugar control, a piece of fruit or two a day, fantastic. Not juice. That is just unwrapped fruit turned into a soda, not dried fruit. That's just fruit turned into candy. Definitely not jams or syrups. Oh my gosh, you know, especially apple juice concentrate, that's got more fructose than high fructose corn syrup. So don't kid yourself that like, you know, these all natural jams, like jam is just, just sugar. It's just sugar. So we just have to make sure we're eating fruit. And I have people put those in their smoothies. You know, I love blueberries and raspberries. All the berries with lots of fiber tend to be my favorite fruits. And green bananas because of the resistant starch, which I know most people are like the super ripe bananas. But if you actually get greener bananas and freeze them and put a little bit into your smoothie, you can bump up the resistant starch in your smoothie, which is kind of cool. 
Really interesting. I haven't heard that trick before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was interesting. I'm just redoing the sugar impact diet now for our online program and changing some of my recommendations as to where I classified foods. And if you take potatoes, and I learned this from my buddy, Dr. Alan Christensen, and then I did a segment on Dr. Oz where potatoes are the new diet food. And if you take potatoes, boil them and cool them down, you elevate the resistant starch in them. And green uh, bananas have this too. You know this, the riper banana gets the more sugar is in it. Mm -hmm. And then same with any fruit. And then, of course, legumes have it and oatmeal has it. If you're doing oats, of course, you got to make sure you're getting gluten-free ones. And I tend to stay away from grains in general. But when you're eating resistant starch, it basically resists digestion and it can improve transit time and increases the bulk of your stool. It helps with blood sugar control and insulin sensitivity. It helps with satiety. It improves thermogenesis. It improves fat burning. It improves mineral absorption. It improves your immune system. It's used by the gut microbiome as food, and it produces short-chain fatty acids to help you burn fat. I mean, it's like this amazing stuff. Wow. Yes. I had no idea. There you go. My work is done here. Yeah, I, I mean. <laughs> now, I hate boiled potatoes. Right. So, you know, personally, blech, I don't really like boiled potatoes, although we just made a, my son was over, who is so funny. He's he's a bulletproof inspired athlete. He's really close buddies with, you know, Dave Asprey's walked my mom down the aisle at my wedding. So Dave's Bryce goes over to Dave and Lana's house and is close buddies with them. But he made a very cool little casserole for Super Bowl Sunday with grass-fed beef. It was like a shepherd's pie, but with Yukon gold potatoes and just a ridiculous amount of grass-fed butter. I'm like, honey. <laughs> but we let it cool down, right? So we ate it cold so we'd have the resistant starch. But that's the only way I really like boiled potatoes. Otherwise, they're kind of gross. I personally roast them and then I just let them cool and I eat them that way. They're yummier. Yeah, I'm the same way. Little roasting, little paprika does the job. Right? Yum, yum. A lot of sea salt. Yeah, so good. So good. My uh, sister-in-law makes the best. I mean, just the paprika, salt, pepper. You really don't need more than that. No, you don't. I mean, that's the thing. When you get your taste buds back, when you haven't dulled them down with all the crappy sugar, you really realize that, you know, grass-fed ghee and sea salt – and a couple other spices. I love rosemary. Just that's all you need. You don't need much more than that. My son would argue garlic, but you know, that's it. There's a saying in German, garlic and onions are good in everything, says the little girl as she cuts them into her hot chocolate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, JJ, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about all your other superhuman things, because I generally find that people who think as much about health and living a life of quality always have some really good hacks. So first thing I want to ask you is, on this show, we love to assign homework. Is there any homework that you would like to assign for our listeners to do before next week's episode? Ooh, homework. I really believe that we should focus on making a decision to make one change and only one change. I think the biggest mistake that we make in life and business and everything is we just try to take on too much stuff at once. And I'm talking to entrepreneurs I do it. We all do it. Like I have to carry around a little journal where I write down all my ideas and they're now, not now, not ever. Because some of them are fantastic ideas I should never, ever do. Right. <laughs> ever. Right. <laughs> you know, and some are great ideas and maybe in 10 years I'll want to do them and some I need to incorporate into what I'm doing now. So what I would recommend is I just did a dump of a ton of stuff. And as you're listening, you know the thing that you stood out and went, oh, I should really be doing that. Mm -hmm. And just pick the one thing and put it into your journal and make that decision that you're just going to get that thing going. And not just for a week, like that is going to become a thing that you do. And that might take you this whole idea takes 21 days to instill a habit. You know, that great urban legend of, well, it may, may take 21 minutes, but it probably takes more like four months, you know, <laughs> whatever it takes. I find the best way to really get those habits into place is just to keep journaling about them. So they're front of mind every single day that I'm doing them, right? So whatever it is, like one habit that I think is very important that I never used to recommend, and it makes so much sense now, back when I was starting out as a trainer, 
I used to take people's scales out of their house and I only would let them weigh in when I came in. You're only allowed to weigh in once a week and blah, 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 blah. Well, the research shows the exact opposite, that when you weigh in every single day, you tend to maintain your weight better. And it seems so obvious. It's like the big duh now because a lot of damage can happen in a week. (laughs) So that's one I would like, that's one that I instilled as a habit that just now is one that I do every day. So whether it's adding resistant starch, it's cutting, starting to work on getting your sugar out, sugar impact diet, it's figuring out your food intolerances, it's adding more water in, it's working on your sleep, like pick the thing and just make that decision that you are going to own that until you really have it as part of your life because it's the thing you do, right? It's that one thing over time that will make such a big shift and then you do the next. I totally love that. And that was one of the main reasons I wanted to launch a mastermind group to go with this podcast because I realized we were hitting people with 15 lessons every single week, week after week. And there's never enough time to stop and focus on one thing. And that's what we do in the mastermind. We stop and we focus for a month and then we carry on the challenge for months and months and months after that. Like the one thing right now is we're all learning how to meditate and we're going to do that until everyone nails it, you know? Oh, that's so awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like you look at it. I made a list of all of these healthy habits that you should have. And with this whole plan, which I haven't done yet because we've got too many other things. So it's, it's sitting in my not now, but at some point it's going to be a thing that I have people do where they just can go through and say, all right, water intake, fiber, you know, mindfulness practice, whatever that is for you, right? Sleep. And you just go through and it doesn't matter if one takes you five months or five minutes, you just go through till you have them all resolved. And then you go back and revisit in case one slipped. But those are the things. And if you do it as a group, we know that if you do something in a group, if you have a great community, if you have a coach, if you make a proclamation publicly, right? And everybody has to weigh in. And especially if you gamify it in that mastermind group, I mean, it's that you're killing it. That's so awesome, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. I was heavily inspired by a lot of the stuff that I see other Genius Network members do. So you deserve some credit there as well with all the groups that you're running. Uh, Well, I love running these groups. I never, you know, it's like they're super fun. I love going to groups and being in groups and running groups. So it's just, I think for all of us, when you look my, I'm married to a a corporate guy. I can't believe it actually. (laughs) But he's a, he's kind of a rogue corporate guy because he's a sales guy, a big whale hunter. So they're sort of the rogues of the corporate world. But they have meetings all the time. I'm like, oh my gosh, like he's right now, poor guy in Minnesota. Poor, poor guy. Wow. Yes. Wow. It's, you know, negative temperatures. I'm like, have fun. Bye. I'm sitting in San Diego. See ya. But he has all these meetings all the time and all these trainings all the time. And as entrepreneurs, we're not going to get called to go do a meeting or a training or anything else. We have to, like, for him, they invest so much money in his training and meetings. And we've got to do the same. I started to look around and I can totally track my success with getting great coaches, joining groups, right? Going, getting more training. And so, you know, if you're an entrepreneur going, oh, well, I can't afford that. No, really, actually, you can't afford not to. And so I love that you've got a podcast and a mastermind group to go with it. That is really smart to do. So all of you guys in this, super smart that you're in this because this is one of the key metrics for being more successful. I so appreciate that. I so appreciate that. And yeah, it's been really fun. And I think I'm getting as much out of it, if not more than the people who are actually in the group, because it's so motivating. Like the accountability is, is so big. Makes you stretch too. Back in high school, I was a tap dancer. And one of those, like, I always look at, you know, what are the things people don't know about you? Well, I was runner up to Miss Haight Ashbury and I got beat by a tranny. So there's one. And the other one was I was, and my talent in that thing was tap dancing. I actually was a Broadway level tap dancer. But I got to the point where my tap dancing teacher had nothing left to teach me. So she had me teach. And when you really look at it, if you want to become excellent at what you do, it's teaching that makes you excellent. It's coaching, right? So this is what stretches you, what requires you to really know your craft. I mean, it's easy to do it. It's so much harder to teach it. 
So true. And that's one of the strategies that we teach in our accelerated learning course is the Feynman technique. If you can't simplify it well enough to teach it to anybody, you just don't understand it well enough. And by teaching it, you will begin to understand it well enough. Yep. Yep. And especially, gosh, I'm in the science field and all of these doctors and I'm like, uh, you know, fifth grade, fifth grade, can't use those terms. No one will know what you're talking about. You right. know? <laughs> I love that. JJ, tell me a little bit about your high performance habits. What does your daily routine look like? You mentioned hydrating, obviously diet and exercise are huge. What are some other things that you do to be at your best performance? So I travel a ton. I travel at least right now I'm in between places because I'm moving into to, uh, Tampa, Florida, but at least half the time I'm traveling. So it is, this is what's super important is when you have these habits, they have to be everywhere you were. I remember standing in line, I was at an event and I was standing in line and this woman standing in front of me look, kind of looks at me sheepishly because she has this big muffin in her hand. First of all, a muffin's a cupcake. Let's be honest. Right. Look at what it's wrapped in. So she's got this big thing in her hand, right? And she's ordered some ridiculous like mocha thing. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, I only do this when I travel. And I'm like, well, how often do you travel? She goes, oh, you know, one to two weeks a month. I'm like, uh-huh. Wow. Uh... Hmm. You know, if you said once a year, all right, you know, but like, wow. So whatever these habits are, they need to go with you wherever you are. And what I make sure that I do, especially as I travel, is I always make sure that I've got my sleep nailed. So I've got the hour before bed is my power down hour. Super important. I take, pull out my journal. I always vary journals, but right now I'm doing the five minute journal. So at night I'm doing the, you know, what went well today and what would have um, made today better. But I have my power down time at night where we dim the lights, cool the house. I take a hot bath, all of that stuff. I read a good, not great book in the morning and I am a big quality sleeper and I track my sleep. So eight to nine hours of sleep every single night. And then in the morning I do my journal. I always have, I have bulletproof beans. I only drink bulletproof coffee if Dave is making it for me. <laughs> I love that. I am super duper spoiled. So, and fun little fact, the first event he came to with his coffee was actually Mindshare. We were at an event and I go, you should bring coffee, bring coffee over to Mindshare. It'll be super good. And so he was in the back of our little event. We had a hundred people there, maybe 80 people there making coffee right in the back. So funny. And we ran out of coffee and all the doctors threw it. Like it was like a crisis. <laughs> it was hilarious. So Anyway, I always have my coffee in the morning. I always do my journal in the morning. And then the first part of the morning is my brain time because that is when – that's money time for me. That's when I am the best thinker in the morning. I'm definitely a morning person, not a night person. I work out at different times throughout the day, and I do different types of workouts. It's one of the benefits of traveling, but I always block it out every single day so that I have it. And the other – one of the other high-performance habits I do that I think people don't think enough about is – I And I was listening to someone talk about this and I went, oh, I do this every day and I don't even think about it. I always connect with a few people every single day. And the other thing that I like to do, and um, I got a shout out to someone who I think is the master of this beyond all masters is our buddy Joe Polish, is the other thing that I like to do is connect, make a couple connections at least every week, but ideally you know, on a daily basis. So I love connecting up people and seeing how they're going to be able to collaborate together. Those are amazing. Really, really good habits. And I love that you you were not gingerly with them. You gave us as many as, as you have. Food and supplements are obvious, but you know, right. they're like, and if I'm home, I do my sauna too. Oh, that's a good one. What's yes. your favorite of all the Virgin lineup of products, by the way? I asked Dave the same thing and he's like, I think it's the coffee, honestly. <laughs> so what's your favorite <laughs> of all the products and supplements that you guys sell? Ah. <sighs> I have a paleo brownie collagen bar that is a lifesaver for me because I literally like I have a I have a whole line of bars. Mm -hmm. These things save me when I'm traveling because, you know, you can't sit on a plane and pull out your Nutribullet and make a shake. Right? right. So I, you know, I start every day with one of my paleo bone broth protein shakes with my extra fiber. I do a ton of supplements, but those bars save my butt. Like, because I mean, there's sometimes when I'm traveling, if I can't trust the food, I'm eating bars. So, and I've got one that's a collagen bar that I just adore that's amazing. So those would be my like desert island food there. 
That's awesome. And we will definitely link everybody up to all those bars. I've had them at Genius Network. They're absolutely delicious. So... (laughs) Yes, I know. Whenever I'm going somewhere, they're like, you got bars? I'm like, you know, like what? I travel with cases of bars, people. (laughs) Yeah, I love it. I love it. So JJ, we have just about run out of time. I do want to ask, where do we send people to learn more and get in touch with you? Easiest is jjvirgin.com. That's where everything starts. If you are a health entrepreneur, then mindsharecollaborative.com is the other one. And all the rest of the stuff is... JJ Virgin. Keep it simple. Awesome. And we will put all of that in the show notes. The last question that we always ask, though, if people take away just one message and they carry it with them for the rest of their lives, what would you hope for that message to be? It's the one that I wrote about in my book, Warrior Mom. And it was kind of the mantra that carried me through all of it when I I literally published, I think, you know, published the Virgin Diet bedside to my son in a coma fighting for his life. And What I kept going with is I had a great mentor when I was 30 years old who would say, don't wish it was easier, make yourself better. And I kind of interpreted it to make yourself stronger. And I know that we're never better than when we're challenged. And the bottom line is that we are stronger than we think. That's a fantastic message to end on. Thank you for sharing it. JJ, I want to thank you. I so enjoyed chatting with you and I know our audience has enjoyed it as well. I'm really glad we finally got to connect. Yes, me too. I look forward to hanging with you in person, hopefully sometime in this year. Absolutely. I'll be at the March Genius meeting if you happen to be going. I won't. I will be in Tampa. I'm doing this big move now. It's kind of taken over my life. Oh no. What prompted the move? I started working with Garrett Gunderson and really looking at finances and really looking at lifestyle and also realizing that a lot of what I do now, I need to be in New York and Europe. And it just made more sense to be East Coast located rather than West Coast located as my home base. Well, you're preaching to the choir because I was telling Dave, one of my favorite things about him is he got out of Silicon Valley. It's very rare to meet another entrepreneur who escaped California. So yeah, well, the people are leaving in droves right now. So <laughs> yep. So I'm following I just spent some time with my buddy Mark Sisson and kind of taking some taking some, some notes from his playbook and following out to Florida. Yeah, I seem to be the only one of all the entrepreneurs who moved to a place that has higher taxes than California. But I think I did it wrong. Huh. Well, <laughs> yep, that's, uh, <laughs> that wouldn't be my intent, but there must be some reasons. <laughs> totally. JJ, thank you. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, super friends, that is all we have for you today. But I hope you guys really enjoyed the show and I hope you learned a ton of actionable information, tips, advice that will help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or drop us a quick little note on the Twitter machine at Go Superhuman. Also, if you have any ideas for anyone out there who you would love to see on the show, we always love to hear your recommendations. You can submit on our website or you can just drop us an email and let us know. That's all for today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.